My name's Naomi Parry and I'm a professional historian and I am co-author and was project coordinator of New South Wales and the Great War, which was released in November last year. I would like to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora, upon whose land we stand, and the elders and Aboriginal people present today. I'm here today to talk about this new book, New South Wales and the Great War. It's the official publication of the New South Wales Centenary of Anzac Advisory Council and has been funded by the New South Wales Department of Veterans Affairs, Networks New South Wales and Veolia, with support in kind from other organisations, including the State Library, who managed the project, Sydney University, who employed me, and State Records New South Wales. The Centenary of Anzac Advisory Council was initially led by Peter Cosgrove before he left to become Governor General. It was then chaired by Ken Gillespie, and that body of people decided the centenary should be commemorated with the publication. They formed a book committee, which was in turn ably chaired by Air Vice Marshal Bob Trelaw, and which came to include Brad Bonera, historian at the Anzac Memorial, Professor Stephen Garton, the late Paul Brock of the Department of Education, historian Will Davies, and Tracy Bradford from the State Library, who were succeeded by Elise Edmonds. I became project coordinator for the book in 2014, and with Brad Manera, Will Davies and Stephen Garton, we wrote the text and prepared the images for the publication. By the time I arrived, the idea for the book was well formed, as a press release from the Minister's office stated. Minister for Veterans Affairs, Victor Dominello, on 18th February 2014, launched a unique Centenary of Anzac book project, which will recount the New South Wales experience of the First World War, telling the story of life on the home front and of military service abroad. New South Wales and the Great War was recommended by the New South Wales Centenary of Anzac Advisory Council and would be funded through corporate donations and managed by the State Library of New South Wales. Mr Dominello said, As we pay tribute to the Anzacs during the centenary of the First World War, this project will uncover what life was like on the home front for nearly two million people living in New South Wales. The book will serve as a valuable resource in schools, public libraries and online, predominantly focusing on the social history of New South Wales during the war with chapters including Aboriginal participation, the role of women, strike action, recruitment marches and manufacturing. So my brief was clear. Write a book about the Great War that focused on the home front in New South Wales, incorporated women and Aboriginal people, workers and the manufacturing industries. What was not so easy to imagine was doing it in a way that stood out in the enormous field of commemorative publishing, not least the weight of military publishing, which of course received a great deal of attention at this time. The book committee knew that there was neither time nor money to produce a multi-volume set that might do this story justice. What we did have was an enormous collection of recently digitised images, letters and diaries in the State Library and State Records, and the collections of the Anzac Memorial and other special places in New South Wales. The book committee settled on the idea of a scrapbook style publication, where the images and objects would tell the story. I found this idea very appealing. I have a background in museums and interpretation and love picture research. But as someone who was not particularly well educated about the Great War, I knew we needed narrative too. The problem with finding words is how to write such a story without drowning in them. The struggle was always to get the words into a sufficiently compact form to let the images shine through. In the end, we wrote 40,000 words and used more than 400 images. And while we never quite managed a scrapbook style, what we have produced is a visually rich and authoritative text that we are very proud of. What I want to do with this talk is use some of my favourite images to tell you the story of the making of the book and take a bit of a walk through some of the collections we've sampled and the discoveries we've made. Along the way, I hope that you'll get a sense of the themes of the book. I would like to acknowledge my co-author, Brad Manera, who was unable to be here today. He was the expert in the military side of things, and as a result, I'm going to talk about my area of expertise, which is the social history of New South Wales. So you may find this talk a bit missing on military matters. I can assure you that the book is full of military stories. We talk about all of the major battles, and we talk about the role of New South Wales soldiers in those battles, generally focusing on an individual whose usually very sad story reveals the themes of that particular incident. The first thing we had to think about when we were writing the book was how to organise it, and I decided the only possible way to do that was to work chronologically from 1914 to 1918. Of course there was a before 
1914 and there needed to be an after. One of the things we wanted to stress with the book was that there was a martial culture in New South Wales before 1914. It really isn't the case that Australia's militarism was born on the fields of Gallipoli. I think you all know that. The fact is that in New South Wales, from the moment of first contact in 1788 through the colonial period and into self-government, military matters were very, very high on the agenda of colonial administrators and the people of the state. The image that I have chosen here from the State Library shows the Sudan contingent heading off to avenge the death of General Gordon in Khartoum. This image says a lot to me. It's, it's redolent of all of the images that you, that you are familiar with of First World War troops heading overseas. And there's a massive banner stretching from the ship to the shore that says, well done, New South Wales, Godspeed. The reason for that is that New South Wales was the only colonial force that was invited to defend British interests in the Sudan. New South Wales was enormously proud of it. And this little moment of, of a small contingent heading overseas and not seeing much action as it turned out, but this moment matters because it's the culmination of the development of a range of, of local forces and militia forces within New South Wales. It speaks to the excitement of a new state, stepping up to play a role in empire, and very proud to be the only Dominion force asked to participate. With this book, we're very keen to counter the jingoistic idea that Anzac is the moment that Australia was forged. The power of that moment of federation of 1901 is something that is so easily forgotten. It was a moment when there's one people. It's an incredible visionary moment when Australia, which at the time was the working man's paradise and the social laboratory, became a nation, a group of disparate colonies were forged together as one, and the enormous optimism and the incredible politics that swirled around this moment. These politics and these politicians had a great influence on the course of the war. I mean, it's only a matter of 13 or 14 years before Australia has federation and goes straight into battle. At the outset of the war, the Prime Minister was Joseph Cook, who represented Western Sydney and Lithgow in his seat of Parramatta. Later on, Billy Hughes, member for West Sydney, would lead the country through the war. One of the most exciting things that I feel about the period between Federation and the Great War is that it's a time when politicians are learning how to do politics. They are experimenting with policies and parties and you see individuals make these huge journeys across the political spectrum, these cataclysmic shifts. There are very clear reasons why they did it. Joseph Cook did it, went from Labor to the Conservative side. Premier William Holman went from being a Labor pacifist to becoming a pro-conscription conservative. And Billy Hughes also walked away from his Labor roots and became an arch-conservative and a nationalist. What's interesting about the, all of these is that none of them ever lost their constituencies. They always took their people with them. The image that I've chosen here is of Joseph Cook opening Parramatta Park with Mary Cook and she's a real unsung hero of Australian politics as well. She was a mother of nine. She ran all of Joseph Cook's electoral business while he was away. She was an incredible organiser herself. She was a teacher and taught Joseph Cook to read and to do accounts and do all of the things that helped him become the leader that he was. She was a warm and motherly figure. When Joseph Cook became the British Consul General, she went to London and created a home in London for Australians overseas. And one of the huge achievements of her life as Prime Ministerial First Lady, if we want to use that term in Australia, was that she formed the Australian Red Cross branch in Parramatta and became an enormous contributor to the Red Cross, both in Australia and overseas. Most of you will know that Joseph Cook and Billy Hughes sat next to each other when they signed the Treaty of Versailles Mary Cook was over there with them too, as was Mary Hughes. And a couple of years later, there's a fabulous image of Mary representing Australia with the Australian Red Cross. And she also was one of the most important figures in the National Council of Women in New South Wales. She features highly in the book. One of those stories that we excavated that I don't think people need to know a bit more about. The slide that I've chosen here comes from Lithgow. It's an image of men in both blackface and drag, and it's the dirty side of the working man's paradise. Now, Australia was the envy of the world at this time. We had the highest wages, we had 
the best working conditions, we had the strongest unions, we had some of the first Labor governments in the world, women had the vote, there was a lot of stuff that people envied, Australia and New Zealand, and New Zealand was ahead of us in some important respects, but both Australia and New Zealand were seen as models for a new form of democracy. But of course, the dirty side of the working man's paradise was xenophobia, and this image is, says everything you need to think about white Australia. And as we all know, the very first piece of legislation passed by the Federation was the White Australia policy. And these themes played out during the course of the war, both in the treatment of European people and the treatment of Aboriginal people. Aboriginal people needed to be featured in this book. And there's a lot of fabulous work going on uncovering the stories of diggers. One of the things that we start out saying in the book, or one of the points we want to make, is that this was a time when Aboriginal people's lives were, were really constricted and constrained. The beginning of the war coincides with the development of the Aborigines Protection Board and the Aborigines Protection Act, which essentially herded Aboriginal people onto missions. The image I have here is one of Thomas Dick's beautiful glass plate negatives. This one's held in the State Library. And these have only fairly recently been unearthed. And Dick worked with the Beerpai people of Port Macquarie to reenact what Aboriginal life was like, to, to retrieve the memories that they had of a traditional lifestyle. They're exquisite images, both as works of art, but also as incredible pieces of documentation. Unfortunately, the reality of life for most Aboriginal people was much more like this image I've chosen, which is St Clair Mission in about 1910. These people are wearing Western dress. They are forced into a Western mode of presentation. They are living in a humble corrugated iron hut in family units with their people, of course, but living a, a life that doesn't have a lot in the way of self-determination or culture. What's staggering, though, is that despite this almost crushing of Aboriginal identity at this time, large numbers of Aboriginal men signed up. Aboriginal men were specifically excluded from signing up in the first years of the war because they were seen as non-European. The Defence Act prohibited them joining. That was relaxed later on. But even in the early years of the war, you see Aboriginal men signing up, literally leaving restricted mission cultures and becoming soldiers. Aboriginal soldiers could join if they could persuade a doctor or a recruiting officer that they were white, which when the doctor or recruiting officer knew the Aboriginal people, they were generally happy to sign. And I think it's this incredible thing that these men saw themselves as part of empire. They wanted to join the fight for the same reasons that their white compatriots wanted to join. They wanted to travel, they wanted to have these experiences, they wanted to stand up and fight as part of Britain. The fact that the state of New South Wales didn't see them as part of Britain was beside the point. Of course in 1916 when people were absolutely desperate for recruits in Australia, or when the government was desperate for recruits, you ended up with a lot more Aboriginal enlistees and we trace some of their stories during this book. One of the stories that I really wanted to tell about this book was how different life was in New South Wales and how different it was in the city. We talk about how it was a moment where the country does come to the city and I think that that's something we really express it with our front cover which is the image of Premier Holman standing in Macquarie Street just near this building welcoming the recruits that had come with, the, I think, their Waratahs on the front page of this book. Those recruiting marches were this incredible moment where the country came to the city. And the thing is that more people, a high, much higher proportion of people, lived in the country in New South Wales at this time. Urban life was, was um, considerably less dense and intense than it is now. However, it was an age of great confidence in public institutions. And a lot of these were in the development phase the image that I have here is of Central Station without its clock tower. Now, the story of Central Station is the story of reclaiming a cemetery from, from the dead and turning it into a modern transport hub. And that was the way that a lot of the fathers of this city thought at this time. I say fathers because unfortunately they were all men, but definitely the women did support these changes. This was a city that had no buses. People lived and walked on the streets 
It was a city where all of the walls were sandstone. And this was a time when we celebrated those great landmark buildings like the Department of Education, like the Lands Department. There's a fabulous image that we have of a whole lot of motorcycles lined up on the dirt road outside of that beautiful sandstone building, the Education Department building. People lived and walked on the streets. There was no radio. There was no radio waves. The sound of the war in Sydney was the sound of newspaper boys singing out the headlines, jumping on trains, telling people what had happened. We had a bit of a hope when we started this book that we would be able to fill it with headlines from the day, but unfortunately newspapers of the time tended to put the advertising on the front page and the war stories were buried inside. If people wanted to catch the news, they crowded into public places. And we see that as well with these massive recruiting rallies, the recruiting rallies on the domain, the recruiting rallies in what is now Martin Place. And when there was a big event, they also poured into the streets. And you can see this in rural towns as well. There will always be streets full of people seeing off soldiers, streets full of people marking events during the war, and streets full welcoming peace and welcoming the men home. The public life, the streetscape, the crowds was very much more important to people than it is today where so much of our lives is interior and located in our smartphone. One of the important points that we wanted to make about the Great War was that the huge social and financial cost of the war stripped much of the energy from the state. At the beginning of the war we had some fabulous social experiments. One of the most successful and enduring was the Murrumbidgee Irrigation Area but we also had other initiatives like the state bakery and the state trawling fleet, which became unviable during the massive expenditure required by the war. This glass plate negative of the um, Newtown fish shop, which was um, one of the outlets for the state trawling fleet, is just one of many beautiful images from the government printing office collection in state records. These were digitised as part of the centenary celebrations and it was my great joy to go through these and incorporate them in the book. The cover image that we've chosen is one of these glass plate negatives. And I, I think that this image is fabulous. It must have been of the opening day because there's only one woman that I can see in that crowd. And of course you have the British flag up there in the corner and men in their suits and ties all crowded into this beautiful gold lettered shop front. Just before the war, we also welcomed our Navy and the arrival of the Royal Australian Navy in October 1913 was an enormous cause of celebration. The image that I have here is from the State Library and it's HMAS Brisbane. This was the first Australian naval vessel that was built at Cockatoo Island. It was built to a British design and it was launched by Mrs Fisher, the wife of the Australian Prime Minister in 1913 in Sydney Harbour and I just I love the scale of it I love the scale of the industry and the optimism um, you've got people on this massive gantry above it looking like ants so the ship itself is enormous and it was this huge moment of confidence that our Navy was here Australian shores could be defended from our own harbour similarly this image one of the things one of the technological elements of the first war was that it was an aerial war for the first time and, and throughout, partly because the head of our committee was an airman himself and if we hadn't put planes and balloons and things like that in the book then there would have been hell to pay. But we do have um, some really gorgeous images of, of flying machines. This one is of Monsieur Guillaume's flying machine which was on Sydney Harbour and it was bought by Lebius Horden, one of the Hordens. And Monsieur Guillaume flew it around Sydney and pleased Sydney crowds with his aerial feats of extravagant cleverness. He was the first person that ran mail from Sydney to Melbourne and at the time that was the longest air run in the world. And what I really love about this image where you've got this delicate wooden flying machine sitting on the harbour in front of a rather large tall ship is that it's a juxtaposition of old and new technologies. In lots of ways, both of those things are bundles of sticks, but one is the 19th century and the other is very much the 20th. And I think that defines much of the period of the Great War, enormous technical innovation, enormous vulnerability because there is no way that I would get up in the air in one of those things. Guillaume was a legend. He set up 
helped set up uh, the first flying school in New South Wales, which was Ham Common, which is now the Richmond Air Base. And eventually he left, joined his countrymen and trained aviators in France and was killed in an accident in 1917. And this is the image that we choose to end off when we're talking about preparations for war. From here, we go into the war itself in 1914. The declaration of war was met with unbelievable jubilation and excitement. The image that I have here was taken by TJ Rodoni, and these images are extraordinary. They were only unearthed a couple of years ago in a basement in Newcastle. They're glass plate negatives. TJ Rodoni was one of the members of the Australian Navy and Military Expeditionary Force that went to Papua New Guinea to liberate German territories, or well, to liberate them, to take them over and make them part of Australia. Rodoni went on that first voyage and managed to document Papua New Guinea efforts. Then he came home, he spent a large part of the war working in Lisco at the small arms factory and took some of the best images of the blast furnace there that I have ever seen. I'm really grateful to the University of Newcastle for digitising these so they're very easy to use and I, I do think this will be the first time these images appear in print. This image here is of men marching in formation and it captures the readiness, the readiness of the local militia for war. This is Holsworthy. There's, in that series there's men just turning up in turtlenecks but they're marching in formation because they have been marching for years and years and years. Compulsory military service had been an element of life in Australia since a few years after Federation. And by the time the war began, people were ready. The men were ready. They were well trained. And I just think that the scale of this kind of um, formation is something that, that people forget. It really wasn't... They weren't casual people who came from the country. They were people who were very ready to go and very trained. On the 1st of January 1915, two disaffected Afghan cameleers took an ice cream cart along the side of a railway line and opened fire on a picnic train. The picnic train was a Manchester Unity Order of Odd Fellows festival event for New Year's Day and in that shooting five people were killed. One of them was Alma Cowell, this young woman who died in the lap of her fiancé. She was the first woman killed on Australian soil in wartime. That event, the Broken Hill Massacre, really triggered a lot of um, anger and xenophobia in Australia. It led to uh, mass riots in, in Broken Hill itself. The German club was burned down that night. The men who committed this atrocity were killed in the course of um, were shot by some of the militia that turned out to hunt them down and by police and died. But it's very clear that they affiliated themselves with the Ottoman Turks, even though both of them were in fact British citizens. After that, all German citizens were asked to turn up to local police stations and report themselves. And we have one of the other sad elements of the Great War, which was the incarceration of most German-speaking and most German-born people within Australia. At the moment the Great War broke out, there was two main ethnic groups in Australia. One was Chinese and one was Germans. And when I say ethnic, I mean non-English people. One of them was Edmund Resch, a famous brewer, but along with them went consul generals, uh, Lutheran ministers, every form of kind of senior ranking German that you can imagine. And at the end of the war, almost all of them were deported back to their home country. They were kept in internment camps from Trial Bay, Holsworthy, and eventually New South Wales actually became the place where all Germans... Internment camps were set up all around Australia, but New South Wales eventually became the central point for internment. All of the internment camps in other states were closed down and every single German internee ended up somewhere in this state in a number of camps across the place, including the crew of the Emden, which was attacked by Sydney on the Cocos Keeling Islands. 
and that crew served out their war here in New South Wales as well. And Edmund Resch was a very, very sad story because he was, he'd been in Australia since the 1870s and his company was paying its workers as much as an Australian soldier to keep beer going in Sydney. He had been brewer by royal appointment, um, but he persisted in flying the German flag above his house and for some undisclosed reason was incarcerated in 1917, despite being frail, old and blind. It was very sad. He wasn't deported, but I think that the experience had a significant effect on, on his family. I think we'll go back to talking about the excitement of recruiting and we'll talk about it through this, this little figure. Here is Maud Butler. Maud Butler was a young girl from Newcastle who said that she was absolutely determined to do something but wasn't allowed because she was just a girl. She was turned down when she tried to become a Red Cross nurse and so she decided that she would gather a soldier's uniform and stow away on a vessel, which she did. She slipped onto a vessel in Sydney Harbour and it wasn't until they were just off the coast of Melbourne that they realised that she was on the boat. What gave her away was the fact that she'd been unable to get regulation tan boots. And I think the soldier's boots were a particular foul orange colour. Her boots were black and as a result she was spotted. She became quite a cause celeb. She did it again. She managed to avoid any form of charges and, and then later she almost was persecuted. She, in 1916 with the first Anzac Day, she was found in a soldier's uniform and was arrested for impersonating a soldier yet again. The fact that she was one of around 20 girls doing the same thing seems to have been a bit weird. In the end she accepted the role of serving cake and tea to soldiers in the kiosks at Hyde Park and after the war she had an uneventful life but for a little while there she was seen as quite the example of what a um, energetic young man should be doing a girl that shamed them into action. Of course in 1915 we've got Australian troops being readied in Egypt and the image here isn't isn't what you might expect which is images of pyramids and training camps and um, the Sphinx. There are plenty of images of soldiers on those and soldiers and donkeys and of course we have all of those in our book but I've chosen this little postcard and part of the reason for choosing the postcard is that postcards there's a fabulous collection of them in the State Library and, and postcards are really intimate little vignettes that capture the language that the soldiers used and they tell these fabulous stories. And This is a story of, of Sergeant Mackenzie or Sergeant Mackenzie. The postcard reads, Sergeant Mackenzie is a little native, about three feet high, says he will be a British general someday. He is a hard case, knows all the drill and will stand out in front of a parade and give the orders to be carried out. He is the smartest kid I ever saw. You would take a fit if you saw him before a six foot man saying, damn it lad, don't you know which end of the rifle to fire out of? Show this to somebody who's probably this soldier's mother. People like Sergeant McKenzie, children like that, pop up in these photos and they pop up in these little collections that the soldiers made from their snapshots and from their the letters home. We really wanted to try and convey a sense of that correspondence between what was happening overseas and what was happening here and these little tiny bits of information that came through that gave some sense of the colour of life over there. And of course in 1915 Australia does go to Gallipoli. Again I'm not going to show you today images of trenches and of warfare. They're all quite familiar. I have chosen instead this sort of thing. This is an album taken by radiographer Herschel Harris, who was one of many Sydney University graduates and staff members who went and served um, overseas. He was a radiographer and a keen photographer, and his beautiful album is in the State Library. I think that um, some, of, some of his images are some of the most beautiful that we do thread through the book. And of course, I'm quite fascinated by the excitement of practicing medicine on the war. Medical staff were really keen to enlist, they were very keen to serve, they were very keen to help and they were really keen to learn the particular skills that went with battlefield medicine. The two images I have here are of um, sisters trying to put the hospital back together after it's been demolished by wind. It gives a sense of just how arduous those conditions were. There's an incredible inventiveness in 
battlefield medicine and Australians as well. Their techniques for developing casualty clearing stations were emulated by the British Army. It was a really important time. Women doctors weren't allowed to go during the war, but a lot of Australian women did go over um, by signing up with New Zealand forces and with the British Army who had no hesitation in taking them on. It was a very exciting time for medical staff. This is a commemorative book about the people of New South Wales and to me I think this image speaks volumes about that, about that commitment of, of New South Wales. This is one of the glass plate negatives in the Government Printing Office collection in state records and it shows the unveiling of the memorial to Frederick Braun and Ted Larkin in New South Wales Parliament House in the Bear Pit. It's an exquisite image because of the, the composition of it. It has almost like a, a bowl effect, almost like a fish lens kind of effect. But it shows the people of New South Wales, the parliamentarians around the house. You can see young men in uniform. You can see old men with their handkerchiefs to their face. The speaker is there in his wig and his gown. The premier, who is a solemn figure, known as a glorious orator in the speech that he gave at this unveiling was one of his finest. And what he pointed out was that Frederick Braund and Ted Larkin were diametrically opposed in all respects, but they were united in one belief, which was that they could not send men to war unless they went themselves. Frederick Braund was the son of gentry from Armadale. He was an Anglican, he was short, he had military training, he was an accountant. Ted Larkin was a giant rugby league playing journalist from Newtown, Labor. They were both elected in the 1913 election and both of them signed up within a couple of weeks of the declaration of war. Neither of them thought that you could send men to war unless you went themselves. Neither of them lasted a week on Gallipoli. And here in this beautiful image you've got the suits on the floor, behind them are the clerks of the parliament, above them are the journalists and the public galleries and along the left hand side of the image you see the women, they're people, people of the state. It's a haunting image, it is my favourite. I love the cover but I love this image more. Now you might notice that I haven't talked much about matters military thus far and that's not because they're not in the book, as I've said they are. We have focused on the experience of the young men who fought, we've used their diaries, their letters and their objects. We've also talked about the institutions that contributed to the conflict. The New South Wales Public Service was cleared out during the war. Some of that clearing out meant that women could enter, but the real effect of, of losing so many talented staff as officers and as soldiers was that a lot of progressive action was simply stopped. We spend some time in the book talking about Sydney University, which trained officers and doctors and radiographers, teachers and administrators, all of whom would shoot up in the moor of the trenches. It was a terrible loss, the flower of youth in so many ways, and the intellectual capital of the state, the engines of the state, our university, our public service, our parliament. And that loss is something that really is felt down the generations. And I think with the Great War, it's just the sheer scale of that loss. While World War II came closer to Australia and threatened Australian shores, World War I took far, far more lives and left far more of serving soldiers damaged. We had nearly, uh, nearly 400,000 men go overseas and huge mortality rates. As that mortality began to become apparent at home, you begin to see active dissent about the war. And the home front becomes a very bitter place. In terms of trying to find images at this time, it's interesting because there are no images of peace rallies. There are no images of wobblies on the streets. There are no images of the ways in which the police force was used to control public places and the ways in which dissent was crushed. Most of the images that we have come through the conscription debates. Of course, the conscription debates were some of the most divisive debates that have ever occurred in Australian history and they themselves left enormous scars in the community. It was a time when you had men like the International Workers of the World, there was a group called the Twelve 
who were locked up simply for saying that war was wrong. Unfortunately for them, at the same time there were some more radical wobblies who killed a police officer. They didn't do it in the name of pacifism. We're not sure why they did it. But that kind of level of, of fear about dissent, uh, about socialism, about communism, all of those things. And then we've got the sense that conscription meant, meant slavery as the Australian worker of the world said in this badge that I've, I'm showing you here. Now the Australian worker was heavily involved in the anti-conscription debates. We have massive splits within the Labor Party at this time. We have clampdowns on boxing, racing, all manner of things. Fairly innocuous pieces of legislation such as a 1908 law that gave the Chief Secretary the right to open public places meant that anybody that dared to say anything in dissent could be shut down. The Labor Party was prohibited from talking about economic policy during the war. It was a time of, of loss on the home front, of loss of freedoms, of loss of rights, and of, I guess of a diffusion of energy from more positive social agendas to something like this, which is trying to stop conscription being levied on Australian soldiers or Australian men. And of course in 1917 we had the railway strike, the Great Strike, which crippled the state for a good while. And there's a fabulous album that we use in the book that shows basically scabs working the Everly Railway Yards, scabs and women support, women knitting in their support. This album was presented after the Great Strike to the Chief Commissioner of Railways to show, I guess, how effective the state had been. A whole lot of um, public servants and other people were dragooned into, into working. They took off their white collars and tried to drive steam engines and roll barrels around wharves. They're very, very beautiful images, but they are quite misleading as to the power of the strike. Again, public collections in this state don't hold images of the strikers. There's a couple of newspaper headings, but on the whole, the best images are the ones that were produced for the powers that be. Despite the negativity of the conscription debates, the war effort remained constant and government efforts to enlist soldiers remained constant. This image here um, shows men who were actually given free entry to the Wagga show to drum up numbers. This was just a couple of weeks before the end of the war and you can see how passionate the sign saying, enlist today, your king and country need you just how passionate that was. And the privileged position, I guess, given to the enlisting soldiers in this period. By this stage, by 1917, 1918, New South Wales was exhausted. Its resources had been swallowed up in the war effort. Its men had not come home. And part of what you know needs to be said about the war is that people need to remember that they were away from 1914 until often nearly 1920. And I really do think it stopped a lot of the more positive things that the governments had been doing before the war. It just stopped them dead in their tracks. As I've said, part of the focus of this project has been collections and some of the unexpected things that we have turned up. The digitisation projects have been fabulous because they've pulled up a lot of ephemera. But I also, through going through paper files, found a couple of little treasures myself and this here is um, two of them in a file on Australia Day and Australia Day was celebrated between July and August throughout the war and it was essentially a recruiting effort for the Red Cross so it's often called Red Cross Day or Red Cross Australia Day. Australia Day was a huge focus of attention it was a, a massive fundraising drive and it's one of those things that women were really behind and it got women out into the streets and it, it involved a lot of women in organisation and packing and the work of the Red Cross was one of the huge achievements of, of the Great War and has been an enduring positive legacy of the Great War, I guess. Within this paper file, I found these little metal badges and they were proofs done by Amor Company for the government for commemorative badges for Australian Red Cross Day. I guess it's one of those great examples of to actually find an object in a state records file is a remarkable piece. So the staff of state records and I got very, very excited about, about finding these little badges. And then later on, the staff managed to find one of those beautiful glass plate images of Red Cross girls wearing them on the streets of Sydney. And it's just, yeah, it's fabulous, that kind of thing. That sense where you can really touch the past is one of the things I loved about this project. And 
one of the things that I hope to convey in this book. Because the collections that we have all over New South Wales are of critical importance. Lots of local history societies have wonderful collections of, of photos, of images, of objects. I come from Katoomba where our RSL burned down a couple of weeks ago and one of the things that immediately the community knew that we had lost is some of our objects, some of our memorabilia. So documenting those things is, is really important and throughout this project I've received support from Broken Hill, from Gilgandra, where the Gilgandra people started the Kui marches and they shared their fabulous photos with me and I was able to use them in the book. We've received a lot of, a lot of support from a lot of people doing good work out there in the community. We also have found some just exquisite drawings in, in state records and exquisite sketches, things that really give you a kind of sense of what it was like and of what people, I guess what people over there thought people should know. So you have everything from this sketch of Walker's Ridge at Gallipoli to this postcard which is annotated helpfully with where soldiers might find a shave, um, some music, some sausages and eggs because when you came off the front line the first thing you wanted was some sausages and eggs, a shave and a wash, somewhere to do your laundry and somewhere to sit and listen to some music and get the mud out of your system. And we have these sorts of collections. We have photographs, box brownies. A lot of the soldiers on the front had box brownies and they took glorious candid images like this one from a trench that pretty soon was going to be under artillery. But these men are posing in the sandbags. It's an enormous, enormously powerful documentation and intimacy that comes from these and, and these collections which are now digitised and available for everyone to see are, you know, it's really fabulous work by the State Library and I was very grateful to be able to draw on them to, to illustrate this book. As we get to war's end, of course, thoughts start moving to memorialisation which was an enormous public investment and it left its mark on nearly every town in the country. This is Leichhardt and you can see the number of people crowded to look at the War Memorial. It's just near that beautiful town hall. And the memorials are a focal point of grief, of sadness, of positive energy, and in some ways of healing, of healing divisions. And all over the country you have scenes like this of the unveiling of memorials, of um, the crowds flocking around some really interesting debates about who should be on the memorial, whether you should have people who enlisted, people who were unable to enlist because they were injured, or simply have those who, who were killed. We also talk about some of the legacies of the war. Of course the war left a hideous and terrible toll. One of the things that I guess is an important kind of legacy was the, the soldier settlement scheme. And in lots of ways, the dismal failures of this scheme um, kind of pointed the way for a lot of veterans in the post-war period. Unfortunately, the veterans, when they came back, were often so scarred and so unhappy, alcoholic, traumatised, that they were unemployable. A soldier settler scheme had laudable intentions. It meant to give them land, but it gave them marginal land. And the image that I've shown here is from up near Mullumbimby, which probably worked out OK, given Mullumbimby is relatively fertile, but you can see these men carving a hut that's not dissimilar to the huts out of mud in the forest and you can hardly think it was an improvement on the lives that they had had overseas. Of course, a lot of these men were unsuited to farming, both temperamentally and in terms of skills. They were given marginal land. When drought hit in the 1920s and the depression hit in 1931, they were destroyed. One of the saddest kinds of statistics about the Great War is that by 1931 nearly 80% of the veterans who had served were dead. They had succumbed to depression, they had succumbed to their injuries, they had committed suicide. It's a really a really hideous legacy of the war that so many men in their prime were, were quite literally cut down. And of course women were left to pick up those pieces and to take on those caring roles. It's a statistic that not many people know that the Australian government still is supporting war widows today. I think there may be around 70 
war widows left. And of course those women weren't alive during the First War. They were second and sometimes third husbands of war veterans. But they still received pensions from the Great War. And that's part of the cost of the war, was the enormous burden of war pensions, of pensions for women whose men had not come home, and pensions for soldiers who suffered increasing burdens of both physical and psychological injury. And the story of Douglas Grant sums up a lot of the Aboriginal experience because, of course, he's an Aboriginal man, but it also sums up a lot of soldiers' experience. And he was a um, prisoner of war as well, which is um, an, an, a little known story from the First World War. Now, Douglas Grant was born in Queensland and at the age of two, he was um, taken in by a collector from the Australian Museum and the story is that he was, uh, um, his parents had fallen victim to a massacre. He was raised in Lithgow by Grant's parents, so um, his foster grandparents, and because they were Scottish and spoke in a broad Scottish accent, so did he. He signed up in 1916 and only saw one battle before he was taken prisoner and ended up spending his war in German captivity. And the Germans were absolutely fascinated by this um, man who was supposed to be a legacy of a dying race and, you know, is very obviously an Aboriginal person. He was very dark-skinned, but he spoke in a Scottish accent. He read Shakespeare. He was a skilled draftsman. He was an incredibly entertaining and, and intelligent man. Now, his life after the war was overshadowed by what we now know as post-traumatic stress disorder. He went back to Lisco, he worked in a small arms factory for a while, and he ran uh, a radio show out of the local radio station, which was um, about soldiers and about diggers. He went back to work at Mort's Docks, where he'd worked before the war, but eventually uh, things got on top of him. He found it increasingly hard to find continuing employment, particularly as the depression began to hit bite. And he ended up in Callum Park, where he was both a worker and a patient. In the early 1930s, he built this model of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which was his own personal war memorial. And the governor attended to open it. I wonder whether he was hoping for a new age. What happened to Douglas was that eventually he left Callum Park. He went, lived in a Salvation Army home, and he gravitated towards the La Perouse community. By the 1950s, he didn't have many years left to live, he died in the 1950s, but he became a very radical voice for recognition of Aboriginal people in this country. He had spent his whole life identifying as a non-Aboriginal person, he identified as a non-Aboriginal soldier. He'd always seen himself as being Australian, but in the 50s he, he identified with the growing civil rights movement. He lived a sad and lonely life, and I think that a lot of veterans share similar experiences. And of course, you have got the burden of injury. And this is an image of the Limless Soldiers Association swimming in Vaucluse. They were just one of the vast network of support organisations that started up during the war. And they helped pick up the pieces, literally, and overcome some of the bad reputation that returning soldiers had. Now, these soldiers, as I've said, were often unemployable. The RSL, of course, was a part of this. The RSL always talks about how their formation came with the arrival of the HMAS Kayara and the treatment of the soldiers on board the Kayara. What they don't talk about in their official publications and what we do talk about in the book is that the reason the soldiers in the Kayara were treated badly is because of some very bad press that was circulated by Charles Bean. This was the first shipment of soldiers that were returned from Egypt they hadn't even seen action. And being let slip to journalists in Australia that most of the men on board the ship were suffering from venereal disease. In fact, only a third of them were. A lot of them were legitimately wounded. But by the time they arrived in Perth, or in Fremantle, by the time they reached Fremantle, they were um, treated with a fair degree of opprobrium. And by the time they arrived in Melbourne, they were pretty much ignored. Even though they were given tickets to travel back to their home states on rail. People didn't give them a seat. And they were wounded men who were treated very, very badly. And from that point on, the RSL set up systems to welcome men to this country. They had the kiosks in Hyde Park, 
and they had a, a network to help men gain employment and to help them settle back in. Where the Hyde Park Memorial is at the moment is where the site of the kiosk was. And in the basement of that building you can see doors that have got the names of the RSL and the Lima Soldiers Association, organisations that were absolutely crucial to rehabilitating men when they came back. And one of the stories we tell too is about the NRMA, which had a policy of employing, employing soldiers when it began to set up roadside assistance. And returned soldiers embrace this. They're some of the success stories. Unfortunately, a lot of the stories of soldiers' post-war careers were not stories of success. In talking about the RSL and about Hyde Park, part of what we're starting to talk about too is the way that the Great War shaped the city and memorialisation of the Great War has had a really huge impact on the city. The image that we've chosen for the book is of women laying floral wreaths in Martin Place and for me Anzac Day is one of the most important moments in, in Sydney's life, in the life of the CBD. And that march really it shows the shape of the war and the, the shape that the war left on the city. The soldiers assemble on the domain where recruiting rallies were held and they gather in Martin Place again. Recruiting rallies were held there. The recruiting office, which had been a tourism bureau, was Chalice House. And Chalice House is opposite where the Cenotaph is now. Then, of course, the soldiers march up George Street, or they will again once the light rail is put through. And they go to the Hyde Park Memorial, which is where the recruiting kiosk once stood. I think that moment on those mornings, Anzac Day mornings, where the entire city stops and it's silent. And when you know how the city sounded at that time and that, that silent moment that's been enduring since 1916, it's quite a special, it's quite a special thing. And I, I wanted to make sure that people could see how the Great War has affected affected the city that we know today. So of course we end at the Hyde Park Memorial, which wasn't opened until 1936. And by 1936, the bitterness of the war was evident to everybody. The soldier's body is borne by women, and it was women that carried so much of the cost of war. By 1931, as I've said, nearly 80% of Great War veterans were gone. They'd succumbed to injury, old age, and suicide. And the Australian government is still paying pensions to their widows. It's something that I don't think we can ever really lose sight of, is the enormous cost of, of what happened. And that beautiful Hyde Park building, which honours the women and men who served and, and has that enormous, those enormous buttresses that show triumph and determination, but also the grief and the sadness. I really think that um, they're the lessons that we need to take with us when we're contemplating the Great War. So in conclusion, I hope that you'll read the book. We've tried very hard to honour the commitment made by the people of New South Wales without ever shying away from the bitterness of their experience and the losses. We've talked about venereal disease, injury, mental illness, grief, loss, failed soldier settler schemes, strikes. We've talked about conflict and bitter legacies. We've talked about lives cut down too early. We've talked about loss. But we also talk about feats of courage, ingenuity, bravery, inventiveness and dedication. I hope the book serves as a pointer to students both young and old. It's being distributed to all of the schools in the state of New South Wales and to all of our public libraries. It's for sale from the State Library of New South Wales, from Glee Books and from some private booksellers such as Megalong Books in the Blue Mountains. It's readily accessible online and I commend it to you. The proceeds of the sales of the book will benefit the New South Wales Anzac Memorial. Thank you.